Well, hello friends, and welcome to another Ask Zach. Today we're gonna to talk about JV Telecasters, the birth of Fender Japan and John Jorgensen, and how all of those crazy things come together. So uh, first off, while you're thinking about it, uh, go ahead and, if you haven't already, subscribe down in the corner. And if you've been enjoying the show for a while, please go to askzack.com and go to the store and you can pick up a nice shirt or a mug. And also, if you just want to hit the tip jar, that's in the description. So I appreciate it and that's what keeps the show going. All right. So Fender JV. So if you're, you know, if you grew up in the United States, you probably aren't super familiar with the JV fenders. Uh, if, you know, if you're, you know, grew up in, in Europe or, or Australia or certainly Japan, you are familiar with them. Uh, my first introduction to, uh, to Fender JV was through this uh, Fender Stratocaster book. This is the A.R. Duchessoir, I hope I'm saying his name right, book. This is the uh, the second edition. And uh, anyway, in here, uh, there was this whole, you know, two pages on, on Fender Japan, you know, guitars. And, uh, and this whole series called JV. And uh, I'd never heard of it, and plus I'd never seen one before. And that's because the, those guitars, the JV guitars, were not meant, and they were not sold in the U.S. And so here's kind of a bit of the uh, Fender Japan story. So as we're kind of all maybe uh, painfully aware of is that in the late 70s, you know, Fender, you know, Fender CBS wasn't making the greatest guitars and they had hired uh, Dan Smith and Bill Schultz from Yamaha to uh, you know you know get the quality back up and and uh, you know get things you know going smoother and uh, there were two things that they were really trying to do one of uh, besides get the quality up they were also trying to do a vintage reissue series and they were trying to produce an American-made guitar under $500. Well, with crunching the numbers, they found out they couldn't do a uh, under $500 guitar, and it was decided to compete with Tokai and those other companies that they needed to uh, to partner with a, a Japanese you know company a manufacturer, and uh, you know and, and and make Fender guitars that were at a lower price point. So in March of 1982, Fender CBS entered an agreement with Kondo Shokai and Yamano with using Fujijin Gaki as the manufacturing plant and Fender Japan uh, LTD uh, was birthed. So the first plan was to make some uh, Japanese domestic market instruments only so again, these are only meant for sale in Japan, and they were vintage reissues. And uh, they had a uh, 52 reissue Tele that was available at two price points. It was available at the uh, 65,000 yen and 95,000 yen, which the less expensive one having a poly finish uh, and the more expensive one having a lacquer finish and some American-made parts on it. They also had 62 and 57 reissue strats and a P bass, and then they had a, a 62 jazz bass. And that was the original line. And then, uh, and that came out in May. <laughs> so they, they got, they got on it quickly. And then soon after that, they introduced this, which is the TL 62, 62, uh, boundary issue in 1982. So, so that's that's kind of the uh, the Fender Japan story, and then it what happened is is that these instruments started being sold in Europe and other parts of the world, but not the U.S. They didn't want them there. And originally, you had the you know the Fender logo with "Made in Japan" on the logo on the headstock. Then they moved it to the back, 
Then there started being problems with differentiating it between the U.S. reissue, and so they added Squire. So for a while, it had a Fender logo, and then it also had a Squire logo. And then it was reversed where the bigger logo was Squire and the smaller one was, uh, was Fender. And they all carried a JV serial number. And on the tellies, it was on the, uh, the bridge plate. And on the strats, of course, it was on the neck plate. Uh, yeah. So then they started the, the, you know, the, the Squire series that was kind of a lower line and uh, and that's kind of what we saw in the U.S. We didn't see the nicer Fender Japan guitars. We saw the lower line. We saw the Squires that had a SQ serial number. And those are the first ones that really kind of were brought into the U.S. Those had big headstocks, bullet truss rods. And, uh, you know, that kind of gets us through about 84. And then everything changed because uh, Fender CBS you know, sold to Bill Schultz and a group of investors. And uh, Bill Schultz and the investors could not afford the Fender factory in Fullerton. And so there was basically no U.S. made instruments in 1985. And Fender Japan had to really ratchet up. And at that point, the JV series was over. Now, they did use some some bridge plates in, in the... Late 80s, early 90s, there's some X-Trad, uh, you know, kind of high-end ones that had those JV serial numbers. But, but really, the JV series is from mid-1982 to the end of 1984. 85, they're gone. And at that point, uh, the JV guitars, you know, you know, are gone. And in their place are different instruments. So, like this TL62 that's a JV... This has an alder body. It has cloth covered wires. It has a really nice flat pole pickup, which isn't really correct. Um, and, uh, you know, really nice sunburst. Um, you know, great, you know, great feeling, you know, kind of late 50s, early 60s style you know, neck on it and such. And so, but the instruments that we saw in the U.S. were not like this. They had basswood bodies and they had plastic, you know, covered wires and didn't have kind of the, uh, I don't want to say attention to detail, but it was like this was a, this was just a nicer model. And so the instruments that, that we saw in the U.S. starting in 85 with the 62 reissue Tele and, and the other ones, they were purposely the lower line models because Fender USA didn't want the really nice Japanese guitars coming into the U.S. because they knew that most likely people would buy those guitars instead of the U.S. made ones. So that's kind of the uh, the Fender JV story. They were there was this short era where these kind of higher end uh, Fender Japan guitars were made. You know, again, from mid-82 through 84, they had JV serial numbers. And again, a couple of the models, you know, were available at different price points where you could have, you know, either where it was all Japanese made or maybe it had some American made parts and a lacquer finish. Okay, so how does that uh, apply to John Jorgensen? Well, years ago in the late 80s, uh, picked up this record. Uh, this is the first Desert Rose Band album, and you can see a very young Jorgensen there with a, a mandolin. Now, in the back, you're not going to be able to really see this at all, but uh, you know, I'm going to put up some of these pictures on my website. So, for for this video, there will be a page on AskZach.com that's going to have these photos and some other things, some additional information, also some clips of John playing the guitar and videos and stuff and such. So, you know, to help this out. But anyway, back cover of the album, here's the whole Desert Rose Band and Jorgensen's, you know, on a, you know, on a road case here with Chris Hillman and he's got a bound, you know, Tele Custom. Well, I thought it was, you know, a, a made in Japan one of that, of the late, you know, mid to late eighties, or maybe it was a vintage one. Well, 
Through interviewing John, found out that it was a JV Telecaster. So, and then the story gets better uh, because, you know, talking to John, uh, you know, in the interview he mentioned it, but then I, I, you know, I was able to talk to him recently and get more information. So here's John Jorgensen's part of the story. So John, uh, you know, was playing at Disneyland and he had a kind of a swing band that played kind of swing vocal music with Django-esque type guitar playing. And then also they played bluegrass music and that band was asked to go to Tokyo to help open uh, Tokyo Disneyland in 1982. And so they agreed to it and they were there for, for I think a total of three months. So of course you have this, you know, band uh, of, you know, California musicians and they go over to Tokyo. Well, of course, what do you do when you're in another country? You start going to music stores. Well, I preface this by saying at the time, in 1982, um, there weren't a lot of big music stores. You know, there weren't a lot of guitar centers and, and such yet. You had smaller sh shops. And the Fender reissues were just starting to come out. And John said the only one that he had really seen much was the 52 reissue Tele, you know, the made in the USA version. Well, they get to Japan and they go into the Yamano music shop and... There are tons of guitars, and there's a whole wall of JV Fenders. There's Tele Customs like this. There are, you know, 62 reissue Strats in all sorts of great colors, 57 Strats in great colors, and jazz basses. And, you know, the whole line is there. And they were, you know, inexpensive, uh, high-quality instruments, but inexpensive because of the exchange rate, because the dollar was strong against the yen. And uh, so John told me that he and his bandmates uh, bought a total of about 12 instruments. Uh, the only electric that he bought himself was actually a JV Strat that was a 62 reissue Strat in Fiesta Red with a Rosewood fretboard. But then he bought, like some McAfee copies that were made by other companies and some uh, a, a Tokai Cat Eye acoustic that was a copy of Clarence White's guitar with a big sound hole. So, uh, so he, you know, they were amazed at the, the quality of these instruments, so they, they bought a bunch of them and brought them all back to the States. Well, uh, John regretted that he didn't buy one of these, you know, one of these uh, TL-62, you know, bound reissues and so he asked a friend of his that was a businessman that would that was flying back and forth between the US and Japan a bunch to go to the Yamano store and pick him up one of these and so that's what he did so you know this businessman brings John Jorgensen back a a, a TL62 well uh at the same time that John has his TL-62, he also has a real 1953 Blackguard, and he has a 1968 Paisley Telecaster that has a humbucker in the neck position, but otherwise is original. And he ends up liking this JV Tele so much that it supplants the other two guitars as his favorite. And he begins performing with this guitar when he's doing electric stuff. And uh, in a band called the, the you know the Cheatin' Hearts, and then what what ends up you know becoming the Desert Rose Band, and uh, yeah, and it's just really interesting that here here he has these two you know really you know cool vintage Telecasters, and he's playing this made in Japan you know guitar instead, and that you know it speaks to the quality of these guitars. So he ends up using the JV Tele on the first two Desert Rose Band records. So, the reason I played the guitar solo to Hello Trouble at the beginning of the show was because John used his plus a, a, DD, a Boss DD2 and a, a Vox AC30 for his solo on, uh, on Hello Trouble. And pretty much most of the straight electric guitar stuff on the first two records, uh, Desert Rose Band albums, are... Uh, are the JV Telly. So things like Love Reunited and uh, One That Got Away and uh, 
a bunch of those tunes in Homeless. And so I've put together, of course, a Spotify playlist playlist of these, you know, tracks and such so that you can, uh, you know, really uh, uh, hear them. And, you know, it's a, it's a great sounding guitar. Um, you know, it's, uh, you kind of heard it, uh, me playing, playing like, like John. This, this is the, the neck pickup. That's, uh, of course, today I'm, I mean, this is an 83 JV and I'm playing through the old Harvard because it's a little closer to a Vox. I'm, I don't own a Vox and uh, that certainly sounds a little more Voxy than a, a Blackface Fender because this has more, more mids to it. Uh, I'm using a, an old Boss RV2 for a plate reverb and a Boss DD2, you know, for slapback and that's the only effects I'm using today. Uh, as long as we're being completist, I'm still using this crazy uh, blue chip pick. Uh, I've got uh, Ernie Ball 10 through 46 on the guitar. And uh, yeah, and this is both pickups. Uh, <laughs> you kind of heard the the back pickup earlier but, uh, anyway so that was really interesting uh finding that out about john and then even though he switched to a gnl asat um you know about uh, after the the second record that, that he did with the desert rose band he continued to use this uh, this guitar in the studio and then uh, he said he also used it on the first Helicaster record. So, uh, so Highlander Boogie and Back on Terra Firma, those are his uh, 1982 uh, JV Telly. So uh, there you have it. You know, good, fun information. So uh, I guess I'll, I'll end by kind of telling the story of how I got this guitar. So... Uh, on the 4th of July, just, you know, earlier this month, uh, I was, uh, you know, kind of trolling eBay and, uh, I was looking and, and saw a guitar that had, a, you know, saw this telly and it had a really pretty sunburst on it. And I, I was looking at the headstock and it's like, that, that's not right. It's like the logo's in the right position, but the, you know, but the string tree's in the wrong position. Is that some, you know, put together parts guitar that somebody you know, did. And then I saw that on the back of the neck, it said made in Japan. And I said, wait a second. I remember that John Jorgensen's, you know, JV Telly had the string tree in the wrong place and it had the logo in the wrong place. The logo was over here in like the early fifties position. And so I started looking online and I did some research and sure enough, uh, in 82, the 62 reissues have the logo and the string tree in the wrong place. In 1983, they have the logo in the right place and the string tree in the wrong place. And then in 84, they got it right. And then, of course, the JVs were gone in 85. So I found that this was a transition guitar. And it was missing the original bridge because, of course, if it had the original bridge, the guy would have known it was a JV. And, uh, and then, of course, I... You know, it, it arrived, I took the neck off, it had a 1983, um, you know, neck date, you know, penciled on there. It, you know, doesn't have the uh, fender, you know, because all of the main Japan reissues that started coming out in like 85 or so, they have fender stamped right here, and this one doesn't. Um, yeah, and then of course, you know, looking at it, it was like, uh, you know, that, that's older, that's not basswood. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really cool guitar, and so, if, it arrived with a heavy brass bridge on it. The neck pickup cover was gone and the knobs were gone and it had these ugly skull knobs on it. And uh, so anyway, I, uh, I got some, uh, 
I had to get some conversion little things, these little brass things to put on there because these originally come with full size pots and all cloth wiring, but they're split shaft. So I had to get a little brass conversion thing put on there so I could put the, you know, some nice looking uh, flat top knobs. And this is a $10 patent pending, you know, fender bridge or 12 bucks, something like that. Uh, that again, I've you know, recommended in the past. You do have to be careful if you have an American standard because it won't fit. You have to get some other kind of bridge. And then these are uh, Philadelphia Luthery brass uh, compensated saddles that I got and I, uh, I like them. And then the, the pickup cover was gone. The pickup's original, but they had, had taken the, the cover off. So anyway, so this is a, uh, uh, a real U.S. one that I got from uh, Angela Instruments, which is a great source for stuff. So anyway, there it is. There's, uh, there's the JV story and John Jorgensen and, uh, and how I got this guitar. Well, hope you've had fun. I hope you've enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.